All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started on time. Uh, and I wanted to welcome you all. My name is Alicia Wise. I'm from Elsevier, and I've got the uh, privilege of moderating a great uh, panel. We really need your participation, though. We'd like this to be a lively and interactive session. We'll have at least 20 minutes at the end for uh, tough questions, please, and provocative uh, discussion. Um, we are webcasting this session. I think this is a first for the PSP conference. Um, it's being webcast to uh, chorus signatory companies. So what that means is we really need you to use the microphones during the question period so they'll be able to hear too. And if you are joining us by webcast, I don't know where to wave, but hello. Oh, he hello. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't hear you on the webcast, but if you do happen to be on Twitter and want to ask any questions, as long as you use the hashtag PSP2014, We'll have somebody monitoring that and we'll try to work your questions into the discussion period as well. So we're going to have four presentations. Um, Howard Ratner from Chorus, um, Carol Meyer from Crossref, Mark Martin, who has joined us specially, he's from the Department of Energy, not based here in Washington. He's flown to join us from um, Tennessee. So a, a really special welcome to Mark. And then finally, but last but not least, Susan King from ACS. And our objective today, we know this is a really senior audience of business people. And yet some of the presentations will really focus on the practical and technical issues you and your organizations will need to grapple with in thinking about how to engage with Chorus. Our aim is to really help you leave today with a clear understanding of why that might be interesting and compelling and important for your organization, but also to give you a real sense of what will be involved so you can think about who to field in subsequent um, technical training um, sessions and workshops. I think course is incredibly important. It's really exciting to be a part of it. It will help to expand public access, certainly here in the US, in the US but possibly further afield in due course as well. And it positions our industry as a really thoughtful, constructive, pragmatic, active um, partner in this discussion as it unfolds. And that's really a nice position for us to be in. So without further ado, Howard, can we welcome him? Thanks. So good morning, all. I can have the first slide up. That's great. So I'm standing in front of all of you, once again, at a different hotel, but I feel like it's old home day, because I've, st I've stood in front of you when I talked about the DOI, and then I stood in front of you when I talked about Crossref, and I stood in front of you when I talked about clocks, and yet, a couple years ago, I stood in front of you when I talked about ORCID. So here I'm, I am again. And some people will say, well, Howard, this seems to be your job. Well, actually, now it is. So it's just great. And people also refer to me as a serial um, organizer of the scholarly community, and I thank you for that comment. So let's go on. Let's talk about Chorus, which is my newest venture, and I think an important one, and it brings together a lot of what I already just mentioned. Uh, so it's the Clearinghouse for the Open Research of the United States. It is a broad coalition of scholarly publishers formed to develop, implement, and steward a partnership with the federal research funders for providing public access to the peer review publications that report on federally funded research. That will be the last thing I will read today. Um, so as many of you know, back in February, around this time, in last year, there was something called a memorandum coming from the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And publishers got together and they wanted to respond to that. And so they got together in, in spring of 2011 and they decided that they needed to do something and they had this notion of Chorus. So Chorus then fast forwarded and incorporated as a nonprofit entity as Core Inc. on October 1st. And the reason it was Core Inc. instead of Chorus is to al allow for that potential international expansion, as Alicia mentioned. We will be applying for a 501c3 status in, in the United States. And we already have 90 signatories in growing, and I expect by the end of this week, folks, I'm pointing all at you, I want to achieve over 100, okay? And we're already in pilot. That's the, my important message here. This is not just vaporware, this is not just slideware. We're already in pilot. We already have something shipping. We already are interacting with agencies. 
So whenever you do any of these projects, I always like to break it down into who are your stakeholders. So in our case, our stakeholders are the agent, and that's represented by Alan, Lottie, the librarian, Rachel, the researcher, the public, and also, obviously, the publisher represented by Penny. Now, Chorus joins all those stakeholders together by uh, answering the questions around identification, discovery, preservation, access, and compliance. Because each one of these stakeholders wants to answer those questions. Okay? Compliance, actually, is one of the biggest ones. Because actually, the government is now making mandates. And we, although we're not subject to those mandates, our community is. And we want to help make sure that that community can answer that. So let's go on. One of the most important things when Chorus was founded was to say, keep the research money coming from the agents in the hands of the researchers. Do the research. And why is that important for publishing? I think it's obvious, because the more research that's done, the more that feeds all of you, and that's a good thing. But more importantly, it feeds science and it feeds scholarly communication. And that's really what this is about. So what Chorus aims to do, and is doing now in Pilot, is using the existing infrastructure that's already there. So it's using infrastructure of Crossref and its service Fundref. It's using ORCID, okay? That's the identif identifier scheme part. It's using Portico. It's using Clocks. That's the preservation side of these things. So it's using what I've already mentioned to you. But how does it actually work? Okay. Well, today the way it's working, and this is the way we actually expect it, is that the, the researcher will, as they do today, come to a manuscript tracking portal. Okay. And that portal could be eJournal Press, or Scholar One, or Editorial Manager, or Bench Press, or a homegrown system that many of you have developed. What they will then do is they'll be met with a screen, and this is actually a screenshot from Nature Publishing Group's eJournal Press system. And what happens here is that they are presented with a screen where they fill in the funder information and the grant ID. Now, I say fill in, but actually, they're going to be picking from a pick list, which is, in fact, fed from Fundref. And Fundref has now more than 5,000 terms that are in it. And Fundref, I will, Carol will go more in more detail, but Fundref has all of these uh, agents that are listed here in a very good taxonomy that is constantly being, being improved. Okay? Once that information is captured, it is then fed into, normally, the production system. The publishers can then make some decisions whether or not they want to verify it using typesetters checking the text versus, say, what was entered by the author. And that metadata is then carried through, and then when the DOI is submitted, it is then fed over to Crossref and inserted into the Crossref metadata system. Preservation. Well, one of the things that the OSTP memorandum called for is to make sure that whatever system is developed will be, will be around. Okay? They want to make sure that if, if public access is given, the public access will always be given. Okay? I will say this is one of the biggest bridge building things that I've had to do, is to teach them that publishers can be trusted, that publishers do take preservation seriously. In fact, many publishers already do this. They do it through the clocks or the porticos. In our pilot system, actually, we've developed a, a, a smaller system just to show them that in good faith, everything in the pilot is being preserved. Access, obviously, is important. This, you know, at the end of the day, this is about access to the content. So you all know when you all publish your content online, okay, you will give access to it. Now, today, you give it access in a variety of different different fashions, whether or not that be gold OA, where the author or funder might pay for that public access. But in here, we're now talking about a post-embargo time, okay? So it's either or. So either it's a funding agent's embargo period has expired, and that might be 12 months, that might be more. We'll, we'll yet to see what the actual policies are. We only know about one policy, okay? And then the, auth the, sorry, the publisher has a decision to make. Do they want to present? the accepted author manuscript, or do they want to present the version of record? And the version of record is the thing that most of you have today out on your websites. And those would be publicly accessible. Okay, but again, that's the publisher's choice. All this is great, but if you can't discover the content, honestly, it's of no use. So we have made sure that working with, with Crossref, we're utilizing their APIs Okay, to make sure that all of this is discoverable. 
And it could be discoverable by the big commercial search engines like Google or Bing or what have you. It could also be discoverable and is discoverable by prototype government systems like the Pages system. Or even we have a course developed system to show how the API can also be worked. But that's only one part of the equation because many people want to do more than just discovery. They actually want to do text and data mining. So in order to do that, we're working with Crossref through their prospect system, or, which is their text and data mining solution, to make all of that happen. So here's where people can do bulk harvesting for doing indexing. So I wanted to show you a bit under the covers. Each one of you can do this right now on your mobile devices, okay, laptops, what have you. If you go to search.chorusaccess.org and type in NSF, you will actually see this pull down happen. This pull down is again, is fed through the API, pulling up that very same fund ref taxonomy information. Okay, so here's NSF. Okay, you click on NSF, it then pulls down all the information that we have in our, in our pilot, so this is not the whole world of publishing. This is our pilot, and by the way, the pilot is currently seven publishers and growing. I'm happy to say that I now have more than 10, and I'm expecting by the end of the week probably to get to the even dozen. But what you see here is on the left-hand side, you have all the various di different directorates of the National Science Foundation, and if you click on those little pluses, it'll actually drop down further. It is a three-tier hierarchy, okay? And there are more than 5,000 terms. Okay. One of the important things to note on this slide, okay, and unfortunately I didn't make a little circle of it, but I think it's important to note, is that it actually shows very quickly who the funding came from for this particular bit of research. And if you actually look at the second one, I think it is, you'll actually see that there are numerous funding agents there. So that's the Observation Management Program of UC Davis, the National Science Foundation, the George Melendez Wright Foundation, et cetera. Okay? One thing that I've noticed as I got started with this, almost every piece of research has more than one funding agent. So if you think that your authors are compliant just because they comply with the NIH, have a, just have a look at our search engine. You'll see that it's often NIH and NSF, NIH and DOE. This is an important point because your authors and their institutions will need to be compliant with all of the funding. I also just, so this is scrolling further down the screen, you'll see that we uh, have multiple different journals that are here, going back, really focusing on uh, 2011 and forward, and, um, and different publishers as well. Each one of these links by the DOI. We are built around standard identifiers. The idea here is to drive traffic back to the publisher site. We want to drive it back to all of your sites because that is where the content is stewarded. That is one of the important missions of Chorus, is to keep the eyeballs and your users on all of your sites. So, but that's just one search engine. That's the Chorus search engine. That's a prototype search engine. But the agency portals can also make use of this. And we have Mark Martin here from the DOE, so I'm not going to go into too great detail here. But this is a, a clip of a, a shot inside his portal, which is, again, a prototype system. And it's using the very same APIs that the Chorus system is using. But Chorus is also about compliance. This is the one new thing that Chorus is really bringing to the picture. And so again, using those very same APIs and the metadata that's within the, the databases that we have access to, okay, we have developed a dashboard, which is dashboard.chorusaccess.org. And then we have dashboards for the NSF, dashboards for the DOE, we have dashboards for NIH, just to show how this all can work. But if a government agent wants to make their own reports, they can access the API directly. It's an open API. If an institution wants to create a report or a publisher wants to create a report, they can use our dashboards or they can create their own reports using the API. Here's a better view of that dashboard. And you can see this one is focused on the NSF and it shows the number of publications, again, in our pilot system. And what it's showing is some indicators that we've got going. So here on the, on the bottom, there, you got the numbers of records that have an agreeable license. That's the kind of reuse terms that have been put out there by the publisher. Is that agreeable to the agency? The agency gets to say yes or no. They like that license or they don't. Remember, this is their dashboard. This is not your dashboard. Okay? Can they find the full text? Is it actually publicly accessible? Okay? <clears throat> Does it have a suitable archive agreement? 
Well, this one was really interesting to me because uh, I realized that actually we could never really know what was actually in those dark archives because they were so dark. Okay? So now, actually, Crossref, sorry, well, Crossref and Chorus together are showing, shining a light on this and saying, okay, dark archives, tell us what's actually in there. Okay? Not so much what the publishers say that they submitted, but actually what's in there. Okay? You, we don't have to see it, but at least tell us what's in there and give it back so the, you can, uh, the agents feel comfortable with all that. So if you were then to click on the menu item up there on the tab that says data, you actually can drill down and actually get more interesting information. Again, all of this is live today, all of this is open, no password, you can do it on your laptop, you can do this on your mobile device. I often get questions about, well, where is Chorus? You know, what, you know, what state is, is, is it in? So I often create these little arrow charts. So here you can see that we have that ramp up that happened in February through June of last year. We had some startup funding from the AAP, which I really do appreciate. They appointed me as a consultant to help get the thing started. We, developed, uh, we set a deadline of having a proof of concept by August. We met that. That was really just slideware, just to get a concept of the framework of what we wanted to build. We then said we wanted to build something so that our seven pilot publishers had something to interact with, and we did that by September 30th, and we had a pretty big launch um, in and around the Frankfurt Book Fair. We then decided to incorporate at the very same time, so sure, do technology and business at the same time, because that's easy. <clears throat> and, we, and we incorporated on October 1st. And then we carried out our first phase of our pilot from the end, end of September to the end of the year, because we wanted to see, is this something that we like? Is it something that the board, now there's a board of Core Inc., did they want to go forward? I'm happy to announce they did. They appointed me. They said, let's do our second phase of our pilot. We'll add in more people in, into, this, into this. So we now have some newer members uh, coming into our pilot, which is important because it's all well and good to have the initial seven people there who help form it, who don't need documentation because they actually built it together. But then you bring in new publishers. They actually need the documentation. They need the new ways to work. They need to understand what they need to change within their production systems. And so I'm very happy to have these, these three and, and growing uh, new publishers coming on with the intention of every publisher that has <coughs> signed up for the pilot to be live in production within their houses by July 2014. Okay, so production 2014. We're not waiting on chorus, we're actually waiting on the publishers. So I get a lot of questions about, well, what about the share thing, right, coming from the library community? You know, what is Chorus doing about share? And the reality is, Chorus is taking a very open arms approach to every scholarly repository and other systems that are providing access to scholarly articles. If they're willing to talk, we're willing to talk. So Share and Chorus met in July of 2013 to discuss initiatives, and we, and we decided to jointly work on persistent identifiers and metrics, and we're meeting again in two weeks to carry that forward. So there is some good dialogue that is going on between Chorus and Share. And actually, I do think that there are lots of things that we can do together. But what about data? Because the OSTP memorandum, for those that read it carefully, know that it's not just about content, which we're seemingly doing pretty well on, but what about the data part? So we feel that it's right now it's unclear whether, whether or not there's just one unified mechanism for data and publications. It may be, maybe not. This is really the nascent part of this whole operation. But we do believe that there's value in connecting the, the data that's within the papers okay, to the papers that support it. Okay, so we think that's probably the starting point. We do know that simplifying procedures for the researchers is also important, but honestly, we believe that what we have developed, the infrastructure that we've got out there, and then adding on pieces like Datasite and others who are specialized in this area, we've got something to build on. So, my very last few slides, which will make Alicia happy, is what do publishers need to do? Very simply, become a signatory of Chorus. Become a member of Crossref if you're not already. You need to sign up for Fundref as part of your Crossref membership. You need to submit the agency-related data to Fundref for all of the, your new, new content. Keep in mind, new content. You need to send your public access content reuse license and embargo metadata to Crossref. This is probably the newest nuance of this, because for the first time, you're actually going to 
post this information on your site and then point that and then give that URL over to Crossref so they know how to access it. You also need to have submitted to Crossref your full text URIs. So again, the agencies know how to get to that full text. And you, you do need to sign a chorus pilot agreement so everybody is on the same page. And then you need to send the relevant content to the archiving services if you don't do so already. These are our live pilot services. Um, these are the URLs that we have available for you today. These are our board members. You can see it's a mixture of not-for-profit and commercial publishers. Many of you are already in the room. These are our supporting organizations. I know that's quite small. Again, you can see this at chorusaccess.org. I do believe our slides will be available afterwards. You can see that it's 90 and growing. I believe my number might be as close as 98 today. So I encourage you all to sign up today. I'll make it really easy. You can go to chorusaccess.org and sign up. I'll make it even easier. If you give me your business card today, I will actually s to start the ball rolling for you. It's quite, quite simple, quite easily. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that, Howard. And given that you are two minutes early, are there any quick questions for Howard at this point? Okay, store up the heckling comments for the end. We do need them. Um, the, citation linking is sort of the killer app for the DOI, right? It, it really made the DOI central to our research community. Sometimes it feels to me like public access um, and the Chorus Initiative is the killer app that will mean Fundref and ORCID and the DOI and some of these other uh, license tagging initiatives get fused into something really powerful and compelling for the research service, um, research communities that we all serve. Without further ado, let's welcome Carol Meyer to the stage from Crossref. We're going to dive down a little bit deeper into those enabling technologies. I heard once that you're never supposed to apologize at the beginning of the speech, but I'm, I feel that I must because my voice is going in and out these days. So um, I realize that it's probably more painful to listen to than it is actually to talk. So if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll try to speak into the microphone. And in the back, if you don't hear me, please, you know, holler and I'll see what I can do about it. Um, so I'm going to talk about Fundref. Um, as you probably all or most of you know, Crossref is a not-for-profit organization of um, scholarly publishers. Uh, we now have 1,900 members. Those people represent 4,700 publishers. And um, we're growing leaps and bounds. Um, most of our new publishers are very small organizations. Um, and we, our, our distribution is actually much more skewed than the 80-20 rule. I think uh, we get something like 20% of our revenue from six publishers, and we get 30% of our revenue from 1,600 publishers. Um, and so Crossref really represents the gamut of scholarly publishers. We have members from 100 uh, countries, and we have um, uh, open access publishers, commercial publishers, uh, hybrid publishers. We have publishers that aren't really publishers yet. Um, and they are all linked, if you'll excuse the pun, by the DOI. Um, so the one required service at Crossref is reference linking. Every other service that Crossref offers, while it builds on the technology and infrastructure that we have, um, is um, optional. So that includes Fundref. But every service that Crossref offers also um, benefits from network effects, which means the more people who participate in those services, the more people um, who are actually um, benefiting from the services. So in reference linking, the more we're linking to each other, the more traffic is driven, and the more convenient it is for researchers to use things. So Fundref is actually um, a solution that came about before the OSTP memo. Um, uh, Crossref was in pilot for about maybe six months before that, and we worked with six publishers and a number of um, federal agencies as a pilot group to see whether it would be possible to solve the following problem. Um, there aren't good uh, funding data sets in our data. Like every um, author will submit a fund. Uh, 
a funding acknowledgement differently. They'll put it in prose. Some people say NIH. Some people say the National Institutes of Health. Um, so even if you were looking for text strings, you know, if you're a, a super duper text miner, it would be very difficult to figure out where to get the data. Um, there are some other questions that Fundref hasn't solved yet, but that's the, really the key one. And so the idea is that in addition to bibliographic metadata that's deposited at Crossref um, that enables reference linking, there are other types of metadata. Um, and I want to talk about those other types of metadata just very quickly before I dive into the Fundref world. So in addition to um, your basic author title, ISSN, journal name, you know, the, the typical metadata that you have for a citation, Crossref has started collecting metadata for other things. We accept deposits for ORCIDs, so if an author uh, gives you their ORCID, then you can put that and associate it with the Crossref record. Uh, we accept deposits for updated information, so if you're part of Crossmark and you have a correction or a retraction or um, an editorial or a threaded publication, you can link those things together. It's not strictly speaking a, a, a bibliographic record. Uh, we also allow you to um, uh, deposit metadata having to do with um, publication history. Um, and we allow you to deposit metadata associated with funding organizations. Um, so we actually have a document, which I'll provide a, a, a link to later. We, call it, we, we write a lot of term papers at Cross, Crossref. And so there's this term paper called, um, oh, there it is, <laughs> um, Key Performance Indicators. Um, that Jeff Builder wrote, and uh, it's uh, all about the best practices for using metadata to support funding agencies. And so it talks about a lot of these different kinds of data that I just touched on. Now one thing that I do want to talk about a little bit um, before I get right into the Fundref bit is um, uh, Howard mentioned our text and data mining initiative, and I think he had a logo up there of, of Prospect, which we're kind of decommissioning. That was the, that was the internal, uh, internal name for that project, but essentially what, um, what our text and data mining initiative is, is additional metadata. And what it does is it allows publishers to direct um, researchers who need to do text mining to a site that's optimized for that, so it doesn't sort of hose their response times for everyone else. Um, that's the core of the text and data mining project. There's an optional part of it which is also available for those publishers who need researchers or librarians to um, commit to additional terms to do this kind of work if they don't already include it in their licenses. And so there's also a license uh, switchboard, if you will. Crossref is not uh, doing any standardized licensing, but we are trying to minimize the transaction time for people who are doing that kind of work. And that's particularly important in Europe. Um, so can you advance to the slide that says, can you hear me? <laughs> that says fun, oh, here. I can this one. No, it's all right. See, I have it memorized. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did want to talk about this. So, um, the other piece of really important metadata that's, that's coming is this work that NISO is doing in um, their uh, recommended practice. And that is the idea that you could, by um, document or article if you prefer, uh, indicate whether something is available open access or not. Um, and so th it's actually quite a simple recommendation um, for a standard. Um, and it, you know, it has uh, two basic fields. One is um, free to read and the other one is the license ref. And um, both of those can be actually modified by dates. So they can um, accommodate things like um, uh, embargo periods. And again, Crossref has committed to incorporating that in our metadata. You'll be able to deposit that stuff with Crossref. So all of these things together, all these different pieces of metadata, put together a pretty good infrastructure for using um, to meet public access needs. So I know that's all preamble, but Fundref itself is really quite simple. Um, it's three fields, three metadata fields, the funder name, an identifier, and an award number, okay? And the taxonomy that we've created, or that actually we have, uh, I should say, um, committed to helping maintain because Elsevier um, donated it to the project, um, is a taxonomy of funder names and IDs. Okay. So we started with something like 4,400. We now have 
5,700, around about that. And I'm looking at Chuck, and he's like, yeah, that's, that's about right, Carol. Um, so it is, um, it's a taxonomy so that you don't get all of these free text things so that you know the difference between NIH and uh, the National Institutes of Health and that you know it's actually the U.S. National Institutes of Health and not the Croatian National Institutes of Health. Um, and uh, presumably it will cut down on the, the just plain discrepancies that people have when they, when they write in English or some other language. This is the document I was talking about, by the, by the way. So again, these slides will be available, don't have to. Um, so this is just some illustrations of all the different ways people do funding data. Um, they write them in different sections. They're in the acknowledgement section. There's a funding section. They write it um, uh, you know, in the abstract. In some cases, publishers are actually tagging the material in XML. I swear there aren't very many XML slides here, so please don't go to sleep. Um, but in this case, even though it's in XML, it's in a paragraph tag, and it's written in English. So it would be very difficult to pull this out. There are multiple funders in this tag. Um, so XML itself isn't the answer. The granularity is what you want in the standardization. Here's one that's even better. It's much more granular. It has tagged separately the award number and the, um, the name of the funding agent. But um, not everybody uses the same tags. Some might say funder, some might say grant sponsor. Um, so there's just not a lot of standardization. And it matters because um, funding agencies need to be able to track what's happening to their research dollars. And one of the major ways to measure that is publications. Uh, publishers need to be able to understand which agencies are important to them and to their constituencies. Uh, institutions need to be able to manage the compliance of their researchers and they need to manage the grant process. And um, it's very difficult to do sort of free form things unless the data is in some kind of a standardized format. So this is just the example that I was giving you. NIH has many, many different names, um, abbreviations, misspelling, translations. All of the things that we used to talk about with ORCID are true with, uh, you know, with funder names as well. So we think that uh, FundRef is a big part of the solution, linking, again, funders, publishers, institutions, and the public. Um, all of these folks have some relationships with researchers. And uh, it's really kind of the holy grail, if you will. Uh, the only problem with my little analogy here is that it should be more transparent uh, because the, uh, the public really deserves to know what's happening with the dollars that they're donating to charities and that they're uh, paying in their taxes. So these are the folks that were involved in the pilot, including the Department of Energy, OSTI, and Mark's going to talk about that a little bit more. Um, I mentioned how many uh, funder names there are, and I'm just going to skip through this quickly. Um, and Howard went through a lot of this, but I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this um, workflow diagram. So Crossref um, owns and maintains the FundRef registry. And as Howard showed you, um, manuscript tracking systems can take that registry and incorporate it into their interfaces when you submit a manuscript. And this was really how the uh, system was envisioned to work. And then the publishers will get that data into their production systems, and then they'll deposit the data back at Crossref as tagged fields from the taxonomy. Um, that data is then available to funders, researchers, institutions, publishers, the general public, um, either directly through Crossref or through organizations like SHARE and Chorus. Um, also, if, people are, if publishers are participating with FundRef and they're also participating with Crossmark, they'll automatically have a standardized display of the funding data in their, um, their web interfaces for their readers. Um, so this kind of triumvirate with ORCID makes a really powerful linked um, system. So the submission workflow I won't go into because um, Howard talked about it in quite um, some detail, but I will mention that we did create a widget which is available on our lab site. So anybody who's not already using one of the manuscript tracking systems implementations can actually do this on their own, and I know a couple of publishers have done that. Uh, so this is available now. Um, in the real world, as we've actually had people deposit uh, funding data, um, we've discovered that there's kind of a mess. Um, as you might imagine, when you have authors involved with data entry, um, th there's about maybe as much as 20% um, errors. Um, and so some publishers have decided that they actually need to add an editorial check process. So they're actually looking at the text to verify that that new data coming in is, is correctly coded. Um, 
Crossref itself doesn't have a lot of information about workflow. Um, it's kind of a black box to us. We can tell you what we need. Uh, we can tell you what we can provide. And um, we try to facilitate conversations among each other so that you can make it uh, useful. Um, so I'm, I told you I wasn't going to show you any more XML. <laughs> um, so anyway, the, um, Howard went through most of the important stuff here. Uh, in addition to the chorus uh, interface that he showed you, Fundref has its own search. You can do your um, Fundref search here. You can also search for um, Fundref names um, in uh, tools that are built by third parties. Uh, you can search for um, uh, grant numbers, DOIs, and ORCIDs. And if there's funding data, that will all come back either on our search interfaces or in the APIs or however else people get data from Crossref. So I, I realize I'm a little bit out of time, but I'm done here. I just wanted to let you know that we do have 52,000 records that have funding data as of this morning. Um, and there are 71,000 relationships, which means that more, you know, as Howard mentioned, a lot of articles have more than one funder. And many of these are from the registry, and many of them are actually pretexts that we're considering to add to the registry. And again, the registry started at something like 4,700. We're maintaining it every month. So it is an ongoing thing. Um, nine publishers are depositing. 30 people have signed up and um, come to Fundref and find out. So the relationship is, as, as Howard said, we provide the infrastructure. Uh, we're not doing any of the dashboards. We're not doing any custom work for Chorus. We're only providing infrastructure that anybody could use. But we're really delighted to be involved in the technical working group for Chorus, the business discussions, and also um, some other initiatives as well. So thank you very much. Beautifully timed, Carol. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to be cheeky, since I have the mic, and say four quick things. You can see immediately, there's a, a wall of really cool, slightly geeky, but fun <laughs> art, uh, infrastructure there, right? All of that is needed. And then the killer business app, again, think about public access and what can be done, what sort of services can be built on that. So the, the partnership between Crossref and Chorus seems to me, and Share, a uh, match is made in heaven. Second thing, text and data mining is so cool. It's really, really exciting for research. Crossref is providing the enabling infrastructure. Um, Carol said very clearly that they're not going to be providing model license terms. But I wanted to give a big shout out to folks here from STM, because the uh, STM Copyright Committee has done a terrific job coming up with some model license terms. And I'll fish out the URL for that and try to tweet it. Really good stuff. You're welcome, Carlo. Thank you. <laughs> Third thing, I personally find the Crossref prospect name and logo deeply charming, and I'm going to miss it. But you know, it's not my business. Do what you need to do. I will console myself, though, because on this stage, there's something even more charming. You're about to hear from Mark Martin at the Department of Energy, and he has one of the dishiest accents I have heard in a very <laughs> long while. So I'm going to be sitting here next to him being charmed, and I hope you will too. Mark. Wow, no pressure. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you to the PSB for the invitation. Uh, my name is Mark Martin. Uh, I'm an assistant director in DOE's Office of Scientific and Technical Information, and I've uh, been participating in the course pilot project for a number of months now. And um, have been invited to give a perspective on our, uh, an agency perspective on the project. But first, though, a bit of uh, background on my office. What is OSTI? Um, OSTI has the organizational responsibility for collecting, curating, and disseminating DOE's R&D results. Our mission has been stated in law since the 1940s, and most recently in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which specifically named uh, the Office of Scientific and Technical Information as the office responsible for DOE's R&D results. We organizationally reside in DOE's Office of Science, but our mission applies across the DOE complex. Um, so how do we do our mission? How do we execute it? Uh, we do that through our Scientific and Technical Information Program. OSI acts as a coordinating office for this and manages the program. We coordinate with uh, DOE complex points of contact at offices, labs, facilities, as well as with 
university grantees and financial assistance awardees. Uh, and through this coordination and technical infrastructure that we operate, uh, we collect, preserve, and make accessible DOE's R&D results. Uh, DOE affiliated R&D, uh, DOE affiliated journal articles are also part of this information flow that we manage. While not necessarily the genesis of the course pilot, although uh, certainly pivotal, the OSDP memorandum uh, from last February on increasing public access to federally funded R&D results um, it was very important. Uh, the memo specifically names peer-reviewed publications and its call for uh, agencies to ensure to the greatest extent possible the results of federally, research, uh, federally funded research are made available and useful. It applied to agencies with greater than 100 million in R&D expenditures. DOE certainly falls into this category. Uh, and the memo specifically recognizes publishers' services as essential for ensuring high quality and integrity of scholarly publications. From this memo, uh, DOE uh, developed a set of criteria for a public access model. Uh, you can see the criteria listed here. I won't go through all of them, but we'll highlight a few. Uh, we seek to enable long-term free access by the public to the best available version of peer-reviewed scientific and technical information sponsored by DOE. Uh, we hope to enable single search box of all DOE-sponsored research literature without requiring the articles to be hosted in a centralized location. Uh, we want to promote the version of record for each article and recognize the value added by publishers. And I think uh, critical to my participation in the CHORUS pilot project, we seek to encourage coordination and collaboration among agencies, institutions, and the publishing community. And I am happy to say that our proposed model and gateway meet these criteria. Our proposed gateway or model for public access uh, is a natural evolution of the execution of our mission through our scientific and technical information program, which I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. Uh, the model is built with proven software and architecture, leveraging existing uh, ingest and dissemination tools, but we have added a slight twist um, to those existing uh, ingest and dissemination tools, which would be uh, the inclusion of CHORUS. Uh, our proposed model would leverage CHORUS and the underlying technical framework provided by CrossRef uh, for example, FundRef, um, and not only are we seeking to leverage these underlying technical infrastructure pieces, but we're also seeking to collaborate and improve them through our uh, participation. Um, just this week, the FundRef Advisory Board met to uh, discuss uh, updating its funder registry, I think a conversation that was spurred uh, by our recent update to the DOE hierarchy that uh, we had provided. Uh, but back to Chorus. It's through CHORUS that we hope to enable our best available version concept in our public access model. So, <clears throat> as I pointed out earlier, one of the criteria we set was uh, to collaborate and communicate with the differing uh, stakeholders in the community, including the publishing community. Um, we've had a long history in DOE of engagement with the publishing community and we hope to continue that successful engagement through the pilot chorus project. Um, we have found the pilot to be uh, a very collegial environment. That is uh, uh, one of the things that will immediately strike you if you are participating. Um, we have additionally found the pilot participants to be engaged and responsive, responsive to challenges as we have discovered them. And uh, I think we have a very diverse set of viewpoints, but all of those viewpoints are working towards standardized solutions. I think that's very important. Um, speaking of challenges, and to add a little technical geekery to my uh, presentation with a little XML, uh, the two most interesting challenges that we have discovered to date uh, in the pilot, from my perspective, has been the implementation of license ref uh, and resources. Uh, two recent additions to the Crossref metadata schema and uh, uh, recommendations from the NASA working group. These metadata elements represent two of the centerpieces of functionality of our proposed gateway. First, license ref provides a URL-based pointer to a license under which the record is being made available. Uh, our proposed gateway ensures that the record is uh, uses this piece of metadata to make a determination whether or not the record is currently 
publicly accessible. The resources metadata element provides a link to the full text for indexing purposes. Our proposed gateway ensures a record is full text searchable before adding it to the collection. Uh, these, these elements have provided unique issues for each of the participating uh, publishers in the course pilot, I think, but through the collaborative environment that we have in the project, I think that these challenges are being met. And as evidence of um, the challenges being met, um, on November 8th of last year, our proposed gateway linked to content hosted on publisher platforms via Chorus. All of this context, all of this content was full text searchable. Originally, APS was the only publisher whose content was successfully processed on November 8th, but subsequently, AIP Publishing and IEEE content has been added. And we also continue to work with the other pilot participants moving closer and closer to their content being added to our gateway. So, what does the future hold for the pilot? What are the next steps? Um, from our perspective, FundRef is very key to the success of Chorus and other, pilot, and other public access initiatives. Uh, its implementation and production workflows in the industry uh, is very critical. We hope to see these implementations successfully occur throughout the industry. Um, we also hope to see a growth in the number of participating uh, um, publishers in Chorus. Howard has uh, indicated that we're stepping closer and closer to the 100 mark of signatories. That's very good. Uh, and as both of these steps occur, we hope to see a corresponding increase in the amount of DOE content in the Chorus uh, pilot project. So between Chorus and along with distributed access to accepted manuscripts obtained through the DOE Scientific and Technical Information Program that I mentioned earlier, we hope that uh, our proposed public access solution will have a complete best available version concept. Thank you. Thanks. Now Mark's very on time and he's kindly said that he'll take a few questions now if we have them or again if you're feeling shy we can wait till the end and take them all together. This isn't a shy crowd. You're going to have to come out of your shells soon so get those questions primed. Without further ado then, Susan King from ACS. Thank you, Alicia, and, and good morning, and apologies earlier if anybody heard my blooper when I said, oh, this is idiot-proof here, this big green triangle, so hopefully it will be. <laughs> um, so, as I say, good morning. I'm here today to speak to you about um, Chorus and, and its impact and how we've been involved in it at ACS, the American Chemical Society. So just a little um, uh, uh, observation of um, the impact of the OSTP memo and ACS journals. So we publish about 40,000 articles a year. About a third of those come from the US, and the bulk of those US articles uh, acknowledge funding by a federal a US government agency. Uh, most frequently, it's NSF. Uh, we also see a lot of DOE and a lot of NIH, uh, Department of Defense, but then also a significant clustering about other agencies. USDA, EPA, etc. So this clearly has an impact on our business. Um, so we were very keen to see Chorus formed. We were there at the beginning and I'm very privileged to be uh, serving as the chair of Core Inc. Um, we also are involved in the technical working group and if there's any hard questions they'll be directed over there to Dave Martinson. Hi Dave. <laughs> and um, we are one of 20 uh, uh, fund, uh, scholarly organizations who have contributed startup funds um, to Chorus. We are deeply committed to this. And we're also one of the participants in the first phase of the pilot. And let me talk to you a little bit about ACS and the pilot. So we um, contributed 500 articles published within this date frame. Um, these uh, collectively identified uh, many federal funding agencies. It was kind of tricky to actually weed out these papers for exactly the reasons that uh, we're developing FundRef. 
Um, we uh, put in there a mixture of articles, both stuff that was behind the firewall and content that had been openly, made openly available through ACS Author Choice. Um, if you will, that is our gold open access uh, uh, option. And for us, um, participating in the pilot was really about sort of getting our heads around this. Uh, it was certainly, I think some of the bullets here were common to all um, pilot participants in Awful Chorus. But for us, it was about, okay, how are we gonna do this? You know, what is this going to mean for our internal workflows? You know, um, what does it mean to you know, be able to get production ready? And also, how does this fit with our open access strategy at ACS? And I'll be touching a little bit on some slides with that regard, perhaps as an opener for the discussion tomorrow morning. So um, you saw an earlier version of this slide from, from Howard, you know, how does Chorus work identification? Um, we do use one of the vendors here for our online submission and peer review software. And we have started to um, collect this data from authors. So this is what you see if you're an ACS author submitting your manuscript through ACS Paragon Plus. This leverages um, Scholar One uh, from Thompson. Um, and so people can go in, they can put in their funding, uh, draw uh, put in their funding information, add their grant number, and we're hoping that this will allow us to populate Crossref. So we rolled this out in October. It's not mandatory. About 10% of the published articles um, we are seeing are including this metadata. This, uh, this percentage has been increasing slowly over time. And we do expect this um, compliance rate to go up further as authors understand this benefit. And, and thank you very much again for updating the latest registry. I think that will get us in a good shape. Interestingly enough, sort of heartening on something that Howard mentioned earlier, about 40% of the authors have acknowledged uh, identified two or more funders on a piece of paper. Uh, oops, oh gosh, oh, well I guess it's not idiot proof. Um, so um, um, acknowledge uh, two or more funders and it's sort of like a little sort of bar, uh, bar chart. It's sort of, some even go as many as identifying eight funders. Um, we're looking over time to make um, completion of this information mandatory in ACS Paragon Plus, but we're also looking um, at our systems internally to see what we can do to validate, um, correct, and make sure that those deposits are accurate. And our team is working very much to meet that um, goal of being production ready um, by uh, the middle of this year. So how does Chorus work? access, and as, as Howard said, it's very important that we point to the, to the content on the publisher's site. And for ACS, we felt it was very important that the public should have access to that version of record. Um, so we mediate this through ACS Author Choice, and we have two flavors of this now. We have our ACS Author Choice, which makes the content openly accessible immediately upon publication. And we also now have introduced a new flavor, ACS Author Choice Plus 12. Here, the article is published online and 12 months after publication becomes publicly available. Um, ACS Author Choice is one of four um, open access initiatives that we announced earlier this year. As I mentioned, ACS Author Choice has been around for a while, since about 2006. Um, it, it, uh, last year, we expanded it to include uh, the new options for Creative Commons licenses that some authors are obligated to um, um, sign, and also rolled out the, uh, the beginning of this year, as I say, the ACS Author Choice Plus 12. Um, we do offer significant discounting on these prices, um, so if you are an author at an institution that subscribes to all ACS journals, you receive a discount of 25%. And additionally, if you are an ACS member, and we've, we've seen that the bulk of our authors are indeed ACS members um, from America, um, then you do receive an additional discount of uh, um, 50%. So for the lowest, for that ACS author choice um, delayed and made available after 12 months, you can see there that the lowest fee is $750, which we feel is very, very, very competitive and certainly um, in the, um, within reach. 
Part of um, ACS author choice now also includes what we're calling ACS certified deposit. And here we will manage the deposit of the version of record in an institutional repository or a repository uh, mandated by a funder. Um, for those of you who have previously, on behalf of your authors, submitted accepted manuscripts into PubMed Central, you will know that that still it doesn't minimize the burden on the author. They still have to check that conversion of XML undergone by NIH. And frequently we found, when we were depositing manuscripts on the find of authors, we'd handle que have to handle queries from NIH requesting additional information. And I'm sorry, this is really not working for me. Okay, I'm back. I shouldn't have timed it. It's okay, Alicia, it's okay. So, um, um, so we do believe with um, depositing that version of record, it minimizes the burden on the author and it does make sure that the public has accessibility to that um, final published uh, article. Um, as, um, as I mentioned, ACS um, author choice is one of four uh, main components to our strategy, if you will, a four pillar strategy. I'm going to touch on a couple of the other ones just now. The first I want to touch on is ACS author rewards. And recognize, uh, ACS author rewards is, if you will, a give back from the ACS to authors, is to help them manage this process. And basically, any author, a corresponding author, who publishes this year in an ACS journal will receive credits. And you can see, um, two publishing credits, $750. You will remember that that is the lowest charge for ACS author choice 12, if you are at a subscribing institution and you are an ACS member. And you can use those credits um, to fund open access of any article um, within the next three years. Oh gosh, this is timed, which is annoying, which is probably keeping me on time, but not very good for yourself. Um, we will be making these credits available through ACS Chemworks. And we reckon that with 40,000 articles published per year, as noted here, this represents a significant give back to the community of uh, potentially $60 million. So, um, going back now, I'll touch on a, a, the two other initiatives that we have for this year. One is ACS Central Science. This is a new journal, and this is a totally open access journal. And this is not a plus one journal. This is viewed as a highly selective journal, um, publishing in between 100 and 200 articles annually. As a frame of reference for you, JAX publishes, the Journal of American Chemical Society publishes 3,000. There will be no charges uh, for authors publishing in this journal. ACS is fully subsidizing this. Um, we are looking for additional sponsorship, just as the journal eLife is. Um, it will be led, as all ACS journals are, by a, um, um, a, a renowned scientist um, will be, uh, who will be appointed in conjunction with their our standard policy at ACS, which involves convening a search uh, committee of experts to identify prospective candidates and ultimately lead to the appointment of that editor-in-chief. Um, our other, our fourth initiative for um, 2014 is something called ACS Editor's Choice. And here I really do have to commend the ACS team because this did launch on January 1 in 2014, uh, which of course was not something I was present for, celebrating Hogmanay the night before, but it did significantly <laughs> launch and every day we have added one new article, made it freely available. These articles are identified by ACS editors um, across our portfolio and these articles are geared to uh, focus on um, research that we really do feel that will meet our mission to improve people's lives through the transforming po uh, power of chemistry. Why are we doing this? We really recognize that this is a changing world and we do foresee that there will be a mixed economy for some time. We want to make sure that authors have choices that are affordable, that minimize the burden on them. We want to make sure that the public has access to the final version of record. And I think, coming back to Chorus, and I do encourage you to sign up, those of you who haven't, and I do encourage you to participate in the pilot because it does really help crystallize the things that you will have to do. 
I have here, and I didn't check with Howard actually if I got marks from this, I, I stole your slide, what do publishers need to do? And then I put little tick marks of what we have done already, so I hope I'm okay here. But we did sign up to be a, a signatory of course, and as Howard said, that's very easy. We were already a member of Crossref, so that was pretty easy. Uh, we did sign up for Fundref, that was really easy, didn't cost us anything. Thank you, Carol, thank you, Crossref. Uh, we did sign the pilot agreement, uh, which again was very straightforward. We are already depositing our content. ACS uses Portico as its trusted archive. We are lagging behind, perhaps as Mark mentioned, on some of those things in the middle, but those are coming. And we, will, we are pretty, pretty, pretty confident that we will be fully production ready by July. So please, sign up for Chorus, become a pilot, become a member of the pilot, and uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks very much indeed for that, Susan, really bringing it home um, what publishers need to do and what some of the strategic um, op opportunities for us are. Before we open for questions, I wondered if we could put some additional faces onto the course project. There are other members of the, the board, the technical working groups and so forth in the audience today. Could I, could I put you on the spot and just ask you to stand up and wave, Fred? Come, Pat, everybody, Alice, yay. So and anybody standing up here or on the panel, you know, feel free to grab them, put them in a corner, maybe give them a cup of coffee first or drink and ask them tough questions if you don't feel like doing it here in, in front of everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. And now the microphones are ready. Are you? willing to come out of your shells here. Please, oh, but could you use the microphones in the aisles so the people participating in the webcast can hear your brilliant questions too. Thanks. Okay, this, is, uh, this started off as a, uh, a slightly technical question, but I, I try not to be too technical about it. Licenses, licenses are gonna be quite important I, 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 from everything that everybody said already. Um, and I'm just interested to hear what the panel have to say about, you know, how this impacts, you know, as far as I'm aware, you know, there's quite a variety of different licenses that are in use in, 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 in our community. Um, are we going to have to standardize licenses? Are publishers going to have to have machine readable licenses? How does this impact the, the, the kind of licensing environment? Brilliant question. Who wants to start? Thank you, Richard from Semantico. <laughs> you should say your name when you, so we, the, the crowd knows and especially the people on the web know. Um, so we're starting off s slowly because this is a new area. So the intention of the license ref tags is to be able to point to a URL where those reuse terms are available. Now those reuse terms are not today standardized. However, initiatives like the NISO initiatives and the work that STM is doing is starting to coalesce that. So you're starting to get the standardization happening. Once you get the standardization happening, you could then imagine you could, big question mark, make it machine readable. There is, you know, but you have to have those steps first. First of all, you have to make it tra more transparent. They've never been transparent. So let's start there. Then, then coalesce in the standards, then co coalesce into machine readable. So in that order. Yeah, I, I something that came up of uh, the SSP library and focus group the other day too is the Ciro model for smaller publishers is also um, very helpful according to both sides. Uh, so that is something that, you know, there are some standardization issues and if, you know, the more standardization, the easier it is. That's not, that's not for us at Crossref to say. Yeah, there's actually an interesting Twitter discussion on precisely this licensing point. Again, um, if the license ref tag points to a URI of some kind, how could we get um, machine actionable licenses there? That could be through a Creative Commons license layer, or um, it could be through an Onyx PL expression of, of a publisher's license. So if we live in a world with one single license, I don't believe that will happen, but if we do, it can work. And if there's a variety of licenses, that can also be made to work in a much more automatic fashion. Sir. Uh, what about uh, NIH, PubMed Central, and that whole world? What are the implications of Chorus for publishers, authors, researchers uh, with respect to uh, requirements? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, sorry, I was just blanking out there. So your question is, what is the impact of CHORUS and NIH? Well, on on NIH requirements for authors, for researchers, for, uh, and uh, the way PubMed Central is working. I mean, uh, we do feel that CHORUS works with um, NIH, works with, it works with the NIH policy. I mean, I think one of the things that NIH has grappled with is actually identifying the content that um, acknowledges their funding. So clearly, Fundref helps that in a big way. And we also feel that um, this also allows us to, as I say, point to content on the publisher's site, but doesn't stop the deposit of that content within in, uh, PubMed Central. So we feel that it is compatible. Does that help? How would we well, like to? Is PubMed Central still expecting or requiring authors to post content there, even if it's available on the publisher's site through what you're doing? Is yeah. this adding to or substituting for? Um, yes, the um, NIH does require deposit of content within PubMed Central. Um, the mechanisms that we at the ACS have ensured is that that deposit can still continue. The content is made publicly available on our site um, and the burden on the author is reduced. Thanks for the question. Hello. Meadows from Wiley and also acted as a chorus uh, member. I'm the, ch the chair of the communications working group and therefore I have a vested interest in the answer to this question, which is what do each of you think is the top priority for chorus over the next few months? <laughs> well, first of all, for us to get to production, because by getting to production, we then can start our membership model um, and therefore make this a real living and breathing thing. That's my first priority. Second priority, though, is by doing that and getting the publishers start to actively get to production, we, we have the agencies start to really believe us that we're serious. The pilot is great, but it's a pilot. We want, actually, the agencies to actually start to consume our data and start to point to our sites and start to build their solutions, whatever they may be, once they come public with their policies that utilize the chorus system. So it's really about getting to production and then getting membership going. So aside from reaching production, I think the uh, production implementation of FundRef is the uh, key critical piece we have to be able to identify. From an agency's view, we have to be able to identify what articles are in scope. And for, for me, I would say our top priority is to welcome publishers and to in, increase our membership. I think um, one of the key things that I think that we've seen through working through the technical gr working group is, is hearing how others are solving the particular workflows in-house in terms of actually making this work. So the more of you join, the more collective wisdom we will have and the more successful we will be in rolling this out. Yeah, I would have to say that the critical mass of actual data in FundRef is really key here. Um, you know, we've seen it grow 85% since October, so it's well on its way, but 50,000 records is nothing compared to the 63 million Crossref DOIs there are out there. Um, and I would say that, you know, if originally it was envisioned that the workflow would start with the submission. The problem in terms of critical mass there is that you have to wait until everything gets through the peer review process, and not everything that's entered is going to be accepted and published. Um, Crossref has made a tool available on its web uh, lab site so that publishers can experiment with trying to do some backfile um, tagging of funding data. Um, you know, they're going to run into the same kind of problems that I showed. Um, but there, I think originally we thought it was all going to come through submissions. And I think as uh, publishers are getting real world experience with it, um, there are more creative ways to, to crack the nut. And I'm going to be cheeky and give my opinion too. I think in parallel with all of that important work, there's a strategic um, opportunity too. Um, uh, PubMed Central and Share and Course all um, are actually highly complementary. And, and all of the approaches offer something in the way of figuring out how to advance public access, open access. And I hope there'll be continued um, attention to engaging with those other initiatives to find common ground, to um, uh, focus on shared standards and interoperability, and figuring out how to complement one another rather than duplicating effort unnecessarily. Um, we 
all three initiatives are portrayed sometimes by people outside of them in slightly gladiatorial fashion, as if they are either or options. But there's some real opportunities for synergy there if everyone's willing to engage and try to find it. Uh, Audrey Melkin, Adipon. My question actually follows on what you just were saying, Alicia, but back to how we're talking about share and how there could be working together. And I wondered how that might be, because when I first heard share announced and chorus way back, uh, they seemed competitive or, you know, I, I didn't see them as complementary. It was like you went one route or the other. So I'm curious how that might work. Well, share is still trying to figure out what share is, and that's by the, the co-chair of share, his own words. Um, so when we talk about being complementary, there are institutional repositories. They do exist. Um, they have a role to play in scholarly communication. Exactly what that role is and how that fits in with SHARE has yet to be seen. They still have some ideas. They, they're coming back to the table to discuss with us this month what some of those ideas are. So it's, it's very early days. PubMed Central exists. Chorus exists in a pilot way. Um, and heading towards production. Share, a little bit more of a question mark at this moment. So yeah, the open questions of actually how that's going to work, but if you, if you see that there is content and data, as well as the metadata and identifiers, there's a lot of open ground here for us to work together. As far as the, you know, what's been presented to the government, <laughs> you know, using it in a big term, I know there's all levels, but where does that stand, Howard? And apologies if this was addressed and I missed it. Right, so I didn't mention it, thank you. Okay. Um, one of the things that I do and have been doing since October is, actually since August, is going to a variety of the different funding agents and presenting what Chorus is about and how they can make use of it and how they actually can save their research dollars by using mm -hmm. Chorus. So we have spoken to a very strong number of them most of them have said that until their policies have come out, they actually you know, can't directly engage. Um, however, they, some of them are now starting to engage more and more on the pilot. The DU is absolutely the first to come out and support the pilot, and they've been a great partner. We've been getting tremendous amount of advice, and we've been changing the pilot along the way as we've been speaking to these agents. I'm happy to say that in most recent conversations, some of them are making big indicators that they might join our pilot which would be great. Great, thanks. Thank you for the question. Could we ask something about um, the potential of internationalization? I know this is a, a question that came up a little bit in the, in the very nice uh, cocktail reception. Thank you, Silver Chair, for the really nice drink last night. Um, do you wanna say something about this? Well, you know, there was a reason why we uh, are uh, we decided to um, uh, and name our organisation Core, and not Chorus, to allow for that, if you will, brand extension. Um, clearly, you know, Chorus is a distributed network that relies on standards that are being developed. As we heard, the Fundref um, registry includes what was it, five thousand, Carol? That's an awful lot more than the. Uh, Sorry, 57, 50, an awful lot more than the US um, federal agencies themselves. So we do see that there is potential, if there is demand, for chorus to be rolled out more broadly. What we are seeking to do is to work with um, trade um, associations in selected countries to work through them. I think that is the most effective way to do. But certainly, as I've said before, you know, a rose by any other name, I can certainly envisage potential for chorus elsewhere if that demand uh, is, is needed. Does that help, Alicia? Yeah, it does. Thank oh, you, Susan. You I, could, I, I can't really address chorus international, but I can, I can address the fund ref part of it. I mean, um, and, and actually, beyond FundRef, I, I didn't really talk about this, but Howard did, uh, the archiving part. Mm -hmm. um, and what we have seen is that some of these smaller publishers from remote locations are not fully in compliance with CrossRef's requirement, regardless of FundRef, to have archiving agreements in place. We changed our agreement a couple of years ago saying that all members of CrossRef need to make reasonable business efforts to have archiving agreements in place. But it's, it hasn't been reasonably business 
feasible for a lot of folks to do that. And so I think that's, a, that's an area uh, that would need some attention and work. Um, but, um, but it needs to happen anyway, so. Great. Hello there. Hi. Uh, David Sampson from Mer American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, Howard, you mentioned membership, or someone mem mentioned membership. Mm. Could you share some information about the funding model for this and what right. publishers should do to, to budget for that? Okay. So I've hinted about membership, and the reason I've hinted about it is because we're working on the membership model as we speak. The intention is to, ha to roll out and announce our membership model prior to July or, or no later than July, because we feel that in order to be in production, you kind of have to be a member. Signatories, by the way, cost absolutely nothing today. We do understand that in order to be a member of Chorus and participate, you also need to be a member of Crossref. The business model working group is very aware of that. We don't want to double dip. We're trying to keep our expenses as low as possible. I think uh, Susan can to attest that our budgets are, are, are pretty low, but um, we do need to maintain a system. We do need to maintain people to field, to speak to agents and educate all of you. So these are things that we need to reimburse for. So I don't have exact figures for you today, but I will tell you the intention is for it not to be expensive. Howard, could you say something about the April workshop that you're organizing? Thank you. So on April 28th, thank you very much, in the afternoon, <laughs> which precedes the STM Innovations meeting and then also the STM Spring meeting in Washington, actually very, very close by, um, we are going to have a workshop um, for all publishers are invited. It will be open and free, and the ACS is sponsoring it. So they're uh, over there on 16th, right? 16th Street. And um, the intention there is to help the publishers think through some of the onboarding issues. So this is, we're hoping, will be a mixture of business people to understand it better, but also your technology and production people. So please do ask your technology and people to save that date, okay? So, and, and attend, it'll be great. And, also have a look at chorusaccess.org. There'll be more information posted there. And if you want to get information in your inbox, very simple, become a signatory. And that's April 28th, April right? 28th. Great, in thank you. In the afternoon. Sir. Hi, I'm Mark Mandelbaum, Director of Publications at Access. And I'd like to know, are you doing anything to exclude predatory publishers? Um. From Crossref's perspective, no. <laughs> and from Chorus's perspective, it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I guess, you know, from my perspective, um, so absolutely anybody can sign up. This is about information. I think that um, um, longer term, we will want to, once we go into production ready, be assured that the publishers are, are good and credible. At the end of the day, though, this is about um, articles that acknowledge federal funding. And, and I think that Chorus, it's important for Chorus to make sure that that is identified and made available wherever the author may have chosen to publish it. Do you have a comment or opinion about that? Please feel free to uh, yeah, please. share. We want to listen as well. If anyone has comments or suggestions about things we need to be thinking about or doing, we, we, we would like to have that feedback today. If uh, predatory publishers are not to be excluded, is there a way of branding them as a predatory <laughs> <laughs> I think there are others that are actually do already doing that branding. So I don't think Chorus needs to do that. However, Chorus will pay attention to, to what is going on in that space. Uh, this is a is. lively, ongoing discussion. Yeah, we were discussing is. it on Monday over sandwich, so I'm yes. sure that's a work in progress. <laughs> Vin. Hi, Vin von der Springer. Uh, that brings up another interesting question. That is, 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 is Chorus open for non-federally funded, uh, the results of non-federally funded uh, research? So can anybody deposit any publisher can deposit all its content in, in, uh, in, uh, in the system. It's not, uh, the, the short answer to that is, you could deposit it into fund, into fund ref and, and, and cross ref and so forth, which you should be doing now anyway. Um, but the reality is you, it won't be identified because the, the funding tag or the funder tag wouldn't be there. So the whole point of Chorus is to identify the articles 
that are reporting on federally funded, funded research. So I'm not exactly sure where you're headed with that, Vim. Yeah, so, so, so uh, somebody who's funded by a private foundation, um, the, those private foundations are in the FundRef tax, taxonomy, and the Crossref APIs and the Crossref searches will still surface that information, right. but what you're saying is that you're only funds. doing federal, U.S. federal government right now. Right now. Yeah. But, if, but if, for instance, Vulcan Trust would, uh, now is a bad example, but some, someone would have a one-year uh, embargo policy or whatever, and would say, okay, uh, and the publisher would say, we, we're willing to distribute it uh, through chorus, because and then you could identify that, pu that funder as someone who is eligible for your system, and then so that would take the green, that, uh, that would completely organize the green uh, open access, wouldn't it? It's not the way our system works. Our system okay. works specifically looking for the federally funded research. And certainly, you know, from my perspective at ACS, in terms of being production ready, and, and sorry, Carol, you know, I've asked our team to focus on um, specifically those articles that acknowledge U.S. Um, uh, federal agencies, U.S. government agencies, because that's our, our prime objective at the moment. We certainly want to populate FundRef as richly and as deeply as possible, but for now, our prime focus is on those agencies that are, in, uh, are covered by the OSTP memo. And again, I just want to uh, reiterate that the, that the Crossref metadata goes out in the world in lots of different places. And so this funding data will be in there. It, it, Chorus is one of the places that it'll go. Um, it also goes to the affiliates, you know, who query us for metadata. It goes to uh, some people who incorporate their, um, uh, their metadata with ours. And so this is going to be available to any of those folks, so, so a, um, a funder you know, could get this metadata either for free or through one of our affiliate services. So it's, it's not restricted to U.S. government agencies in general, but that's a, that's a business decision, of course, whether to include all the data. Right, M Mark, I have a question for you. I hope it's an easy one. Um, I think that all of the agencies are just waiting now for OSDP to give them feedback on their draft policies. Is that correct, and do you have any clue when that might happen? That is correct. Um, as of today, we have received uh, no formal feedback on our policy. We're waiting for that. We hope to have it soon. Um, and I suspect all of the other agencies are in a similar situation. Yeah. yeah. I, I, can, I can confirm, having spoken to a few of these agencies in the past week, that they're all in the same boat as DOE. Okay. And does anyone on the floor have any more insight into that? <laughs> No. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, this is Jennifer Griffiths with the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, I was actually wondering how you envision the leadership of course evolving, especially as you start to move into more international markets. Well, we've just recently formed, and we formed with an interim board. We have our bylaws, and we do see um, uh, opportunities and necessity for expansion, particularly if we do look to expand the services that we provide beyond that for servicing the U.S. government. So I don't know if that helps. Does that help, Jennifer? So you said, um, so you're planning to expand, like, the board of directors or just consulting with different uh, organizations within the countries? We have an established, um, um, as I say, board at the moment. It is an interim board. We do have processes in place for uh, appointments to that board. And I think that you know, as we move into production ready and, and identify our membership model, those will be the times and opportunities we'll be thinking about um, expanding the board and making sure that the board represents our constituents. So the governance yes. is one strategic element of an internationalization discussion. I guess it's a good sign that the, the chair of the board is Scottish, yes. <laughs> That's <laughs> right, a bit you. of international <laughs> flavor already. All right, thank you. Thank you. So would you all like coffee now? Or would you like to have any other chance to ask questions that are lurking? Hooray then. Let's give the panelists a really big round of applause. Thank you very much indeed.